How many times can we review a Corolla? A toy Yoda Corolla. Yeah. 2020 Toyota Corolla Hatch 6MT. All you have to do to make something valuable is to offer it in a world where that thing doesn't exist. Doesn't matter if that thing's inherently more valuable than what came before it, and it doesn't matter if that thing always existed, and it doesn't really matter if that thing is any good. Any port in a storm, any pond in a desert, and any log in an ocean, and any stick in a sea of CVTs. Well, for as familiar as the Corolla is, it's not often you feel like you're getting sold a bill of goods. A Corolla was built on a foundation of being more or less what it appears to be, but this is something different. On one hand, it's a decent commuter car that gets solid gas mileage, averaging around 32 city and 41 highway. But if you go in thinking this is a hot hatch, well, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Sure, it's got a manual transmission, but that doesn't make it sporty. It doesn't make it an enthusiast car. But because enthusiasts feel more and more like an oppressed class whose needs aren't being catered to, they'll find reasons to get excited about things like this. This is a hint that automakers might still want to make cars with manual transmissions, rather than pushing CVTs onto the world. Even though CVTs can accelerate past Funky Boy's wild rampage on Robo World, this car is the dream that automakers might still want to make cars a gearhead can have fun with, rather than the plasticky, smooth-brained wind-up toys that pass for sporty cars in 2020 a year that only sounds futuristic and utopian in concept. 2020 lives in the memories of our youthful expectations of what the future would look like. Yeah, we have computers with insane processing power that we store comfortably next to our balls as we walk down the street. But in the auto industry, we live in a world where we grade companies on a curve. 2020 Toyota Corolla Hatchback SE. For the man whose favorite book is by Tucker Max. The chassis code for this Corolla, known overseas as the Aris, Arus, Arus, is the E210. The 12th gen Corolla runs on the Toyota new global architecture series of modular unibody platforms. In this case, the GA-C, which replaced the front wheel drive MC platforms. The engine is the 2 liter M20A FKS, dynamic force inline 4 offering a slight increase in displacement from the previous generation's 1.8 liter 2 ZRFE. You get around 170 horsepower and 150 foot-pounds of torque at the crank. This also features Toyota's D4S fuel injection, which means you get simultaneously port injection and direct fuel injection. Primarily, this car will be running on the DGI, but occasionally port fuel injection will kick in. The idea is you can get a more dynamic burn, I guess, whatever dynamic means. But when people look at it, they look at it as insurance for their intake valves. That, yeah, they're getting sprayed with gasoline uh, too, and that's going to clean them. And it also has a 13 to 1 compression ratio, although it still takes regular 87 octane. I'm guessing they pulled that off with uh, clever ignition timing. You do get more power, but not much more than a pencil eraser's worth. But the engine achieves 40% better thermal efficiency than the old 2ZR FE. This car runs on the Auto and Actinson cycles, although it went back to using a proper spin-on type oil filter instead of the cartridge-style filter. Modifications include a TRD air intake, Remark Center Exit Catback Exhaust, Shift Solutions Custom Weighted Shift Knob with added custom TRD logo, OEM Spoiler, rocker applique and mud guards, NK EDR9 wheels, and an FRP small chin spoiler. I like Kyle, the owner. He brings us fun things, like this taco and the other Rolla. His modifications are usually tasteful, but this time he went full show with no go. I told him this, I'm like, look, I gotta, I gotta dig into you a little bit for these modifications. I like you, but this is RCR. This exhaust only adds decibels. The intake is just for an under the hood display. And the weighted shifter is too heavy. And it and it's shaped like a Red Bull can. I mean, when I drove this car, I kept fingering the edges of the shift knob because they're sharp and tactically distracting. And I don't know what this new trend is about of having these can style shift knobs. They're not ergonomic. 
They feel strange. They're hard to hold. I think about them too much when I'm driving. Are they just to make the shifter look butch? Or maybe I'm aging. No, wait, these things existed in the 90s. Eh, I'm getting sidetracked. Okay, under the hood. Your intake tube is bigger. So? The throttle body is the same size. Oh, the exhaust pipe is wider. So? The headers are the same diameter. In 2020, opening up the exhaust or, or the intake piping or even putting on a different throttle body doesn't do anything because the ECU is still in control. It's programmed to make 170 horsepower. That's it. So unless you go in there with a computer and remap the ECU, this, all, all, this, all this stuff does nothing. And that's not the worst of it. My favorite part of Thor Ragnarok is fan art of Hulk's dick. And that's not the worst of it. Say you have all bolt-on parts for the M20A FKS. You still don't get any power, even if we're, just ignore the ECU for a minute. You're not gonna get any more power because the valves are still only opening this much. I can give you a regular drinking straw or one of those fat ones for bubble tea. It's not gonna matter if your jaw's wired shut. Well, I just like the sound these pipes make. What sound? We're back to those valves again, being driven by camshafts with all the lobing of a pool cue. This is a stock camshaft for a Ford 50 HO. Look at the difference between open and close. You put an aftermarket exhaust on an engine like this, and it sounds like this. These are the stock overhead cams for an M20A FKS. With an aftermarket exhaust, they sound like this. Oh, really? There's no throatiness to enhance. It's like, it's like parents zooming in on a two megapixel photo and wondering why it's all blurry. Can't you just clear it up? No, there's no data there. Huh? There's no resolution there to begin with. Huh? It wasn't designed that way. From its core, Toyota made the M20A FKS to be a quiet, fuel-efficient engine, and it runs on 87 octane. Slap on a performance exhaust, and what do you get? You get a quiet, fuel-efficient engine that runs on 87 octane, and now it sounds like it has an exhaust leak. Now, does this discount the Corolla 6MT hatch as a driver's car? No, 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 it's still fun. You could spin those tires in first, second, and third gear. You could bang the gears, and Toyota offered rev matching too. You can drive this at 100% throttle all the time and be happy. While there is variable valve timing, the changeover is so subtle, I, I can't find where the power is. To get the roll of hatch to accelerate with gusto, you have to get from first gear to second gear as fast as you can. But do it, it's fun. As for the differences between the SE and the XSE, the XSE gets LED fog lights, a 90% digitized gauge cluster, and 18-inch wheels with slightly wider tires, valve shocks, and springs that are slightly stiffer to complement the weight differential between the XSE and the other trim levels. As far as luxury comforts, you get heated seats and a wireless charger, which really doesn't justify the price, though. The XSE goes for $23,240, where the SE is far more justifiable at $20,290. Most cars are worse than a Corolla. That's been true since the Corolla was born. Even the worst Corolla is still more reliable than most reliable things on the road. But we're at the point where being dependable isn't enough for Corollas anymore because it's expected, it's taken as a given. So the question becomes, what are you going to do for me, Corolla? Because this dick isn't gonna flatten itself. Yes, customization and modification is part of the fun of a hot hatch, but this isn't the hot hatch Toyota wants you to believe that it is. So there has to be more at the intro level. Whether it's more power, better handling, a more impressive style. The frickin' Yaris German Gerby German that we're not getting from Europe. Why can't we have the good Yaris? That's what we're going to pin our hopes on. Because without that, you're a soldier going off to war with an empty locket. In the grand scheme of things, what are you really fighting the enthusiast car fight for if automakers don't value that experience enough to make cars that satisfy the craving for that experience? Then again, unless people, 
actually buy enthusiast cars rather than gawk at them online, what incentive does any automaker have to keep making enthusiast cars? It's a dilemma that's going to get more complicated over time. Perhaps the simplicity of little cars like this will one day become something we long for. Like one last beer with your college friends. Or one last talk with a girl who just wants to be friends. Who knows? But for now, it's not hard to wish for automakers to do better. Because history tells us that they can, even if recent history doesn't. The new Toyota, I'm not gonna fake it. This new Corolla's got me falling asleep. It's not exciting, but who says it would be? You know you're driving the hatchback SC. I know you're driving, but I can't believe. Oh, wait, who's there?